And we are now live. So welcome, everybody. Uh, if you're new here, we have a tech talk every month from our website where somebody from our site gives a talk. And today, we're lucky enough to have two speakers. We have Sheshire and Orda. And they're going to be giving a tech talk on CocoaPods. So Sheshire is going to start out uh, with a little bit of tech demo. And then Orda is going to jump in with some more information. If uh, this is your first time at one of our Hangouts, you can ask questions. There's a way where you can click on Q&A on the video and submit your questions. And when we get to the Q&A period, I'll look for the most popular questions and uh, ask them to these guys. So feel free to submit any time. So hope you all enjoy this talk. And uh, on to Sheshire. OK. Uh, screen share is on, right? Can you yeah. see the slides? Yeah. OK, good. Uh, well, I'm here to talk about CocoaPods. And uh, well, first of all, what's CocoaPods? It's a dependency management tool. So a tool that allows you to uh, import uh, and manage dependencies between uh, usually third-party libraries or any third-party element that you bring in to your project. Um, it's nothing new in, in a sense that dependency management is a well-known uh, uh, pain in the neck, I would say. But what happens usually is that you start with an Xcode project and, well, at, at the beginning you feel adventurous and you, you think you can write all the code uh, by yourself. And then you start uh, looking around for third-party libraries, and some look interesting, especially in the iOS community in which, you know, many, many people uh, release uh, many, many libraries with a very permissive uh, license. And so you start to bring in uh, a few libraries, third-party libraries, and everything is fine. You go to GitHub, you copy the library or clone that, and you find the right uh, files in the folders, you drop uh, them on Xcode, and then you start using the library. And everything is fine. You start with one, with two, but as the project grows, probably you will stumble upon this situation, in which a third-party library depends on another third-party library. Uh, and specifically, a very specific version of another third-party library. And so quickly, you are in dependency hell. Uh, especially, in fact, uh, you, you can have uh, different problems. One is that one is related to your code. So you probably have your own libraries uh, that you use and reuse in all your projects. And uh, they are spread anywhere. So the sum is in a project file folder somewhere in a, in a, for, for, a, for a job that you did three years ago. Uh, another one is, is somewhere else, and so on and so forth. CocoaPods can help you with that. Also, uh, talking about third-party libraries, which version uh, am I running? I'm not sure. Not everybody puts a version in a third-party library. Um, so it's not easy. And uh, very, very important, how do I update to the new or next version of a library? Absolutely not easy. Um, in fact, as I said, uh, dependency management is a very well-known pain in the neck. Uh, if you're a Java developer, you're probably familiar with Ivy or SBT, which supports also Scala. Uh, I'm aware there's Maven for Java, but I didn't want mentioned that in the slides because, you know, it, it evokes nightmares. Ruby has Ruby gems. Um, J, uh, JavaScript has Bower, or for the British guys, Bower. And Node.js has NPM, Python has PIP, PHP uh, as the old peer, and the recently uh, released Composer. All these tools uh, allow you, in essence, to do something like this. Write somewhere, using some formalism, a set of statements, um, usually in a configuration file. And what you say is something like, I wanted this version of a library. I wanted that version 
of another library. I want the newest version of this kind of library. Uh, I want at least version X of another library, or I want at most this version for this library. And uh, once you have compiled this file, essentially what you want to do is go to the terminal and run a simple command that says grab these libraries for me. And so behind the scenes, uh, this tool man does a lot, like finding the right version, finding the right dependencies, uh, and so on and so forth, and downloads and configures your project. So how do you install CocoaPods? Uh, well, CocoaPods requires Ruby, but you're, you're safe because uh, Mountain Lion comes with Ruby, I guess 1.8.7, and Mavericks comes with uh, 2.0 uh, version of Ruby. So you're fine. If you're not a Ruby developer, uh, it's probably a good idea to run uh, this first command, so sudo gem update dash dash system, and that updates uh, all the libraries needed for and the gems needed by Ruby to be up to date. Uh, the second command is the key, uh, sudo gem install CocoaPods, and this grabs uh, the CocoaPod gem and all its dependency in order to run uh, the pod command. And I should mention that you have to do this just once at the beginning when you start um, running, uh, when, you, when you use CocoaPod for the first time uh, on, this, on, on, your, on your machine. Uh, once you have installed CocoaPods, you will have available in your terminal the pod command. And the, the, the very first time you use that, you should run pod setup. So this downloads all the repository of the, of, of the Cocoa Pods uh, available. And so just to give you an idea, I have a fresh installation of Mavericks here. No, thank you. And um, try tonight, yes. And I have run so the most recent command that I have run is sudo gem install CocoaPods, and as you can see, it downloads all the libraries needed for the pod command. Okay, uh, if you are a Ruby developer, you're probably using RVM or RVM, which are version management systems for Ruby, and you probably already know that you do not need to, to run the sudo command. So without further ado, I think it's time for a short demo. And uh, I have some code here that I'm going to copy and put on my desktop in here. It's a starter project. And it's very, very simple, generated using a master detail template. Come on, Xcode. Well, probably because I'm running something in the background. OK. And as you can see, it does not compile because, uh, well, this is the very simple structure. Uh, it loads, it, it runs a search uh, using the iTunes API here. And this is VD load. It runs a search, it retrieves, uh, in this case, the tracks by J Jack Johnson, parses that in some uh, model, which is a class I define it, very, very simple. And uh, it populates uh, the array and calls reload data. So no rocket science at all. This um, project uses uh, AF networking. So here you see a HTTP request operation manager. It's correctly imported in here, but uh, as you can see in the tree here, there's no uh, AF networking. Of course, at this point, you can go to GitHub, download AF networking, drag it in here, uh, and you're safe, and you're good to go. Build and run, uh, and bye-bye. 
But you can use the CocoaPod way, uh, which allows you to uh, manage all the dependency, all the dependencies of this project. So how do you um, uh, configure this project to be used with CocoaPod? Uh, very, very easy. You open a uh, in the folder of the project, I suggest you, you put it here, but you can put it anywhere because the pod command allows you to specify paths for uh, both the Xcode project and the pod file. But in here, you should create a file using any text editor that you like, which is, call, which is called uh, pod file. So the very first line, which is very important, is to specify the platform. Uh, I forgot to mention that CocoaPods works for both iOS and Mac. In this case, we are talking about a iOS application. So this is the very first line that I need. And then uh, the second line is pod, simple, like that. And in this case, what I want is AF networking. So this is the smallest amount of characters that I need to create a pod file. And of course, I can go on and add more libraries, and we'll see that later. But now let's just focus on CocoaPod on, on AF networking. So I'm going to save this, and it's going to be, uh, it has to be called pod file, capital P. Now I'm going to put that temporarily on the desktop, but I'm going to move it here in the project folder. Okay. So now. Um, I'm going to go to the terminal and cd and project. And then here the magic happens because all I have to do is say pod install. A little spoiler, this is not going to work. And I'm doing that on purpose. And we'll see why. But here, this command, uh, and it's also very descriptive in providing feedback. The platform of the target pods, iOS 4.3, is not compatible with AF networking 2.1.0, which is a minimum requirement of iOS 6 or OS 10. So in my pod file here, I did not, I forgot on purpose to put this comma, and version of iOS that I want to support. So let's say at the moment 7.0. I'm going to save this file again, but this is important. If you do not provide any value, the default is 4.3. But I'd like to highlight the magic behind this. So the pod install went to the repository of all the Kofu pods and tried to pull uh, AF networking, which in the CocoaPod, in its CocoaPod, has declared a minimal version of iOS 6. So it detected a mismatch that you have to, uh, that you do not have to discover at code time. So as long as I provide iOS 6 or 7, in, in the case of AF networking, everything is fine. I rerun pod install. I like to close Xcode while this is uh, doing all the magic. Analyzing dependencies, downloading dependencies, maybe Orto will talk about that, but this analyzing dependencies, it can be hell because it's, it involves graph uh, walking. I mean, walking a complex graph of, of uh, nodes. Uh, so this has downloaded uh, the version of IF networking, in this case 2.1.0, and we'll see why. It generated a POTS project, integrated the, this POTS project in the client project, and this is very, very important. From now on, use CocoaPods.xe workspace. Uh, you can ignore this because it's related to Ruby. So as you can see in my folder, there's way more stuff now. Um, in case you do not read this and you're used to go to the Xcode project, you can try to open that, but it will not build, <clears throat> as we'll see in a second. 
And the reason for that is because this project is now part, uh, apart from the uh, AF, AF networking dependency, this is not going to work anyway. Uh, because, and we'll see that once I open the workspace, now we are in a uh, workspace that has two projects. One is the pods project, and one is Cuckoo Pods, which is my project. So this is, can be named, uh, this will, be, will have the name of your own project. Uh, uh, when you use Cuckoo Pods, you will always find this, in which you'll find grouped, well, this is a framework, sorry, the pods that you have specified in the pod file. In this case, th there's just one, but if I add more libraries, they'll, they'll pop up in here, okay? Now, I did not change any code. I'll uh, just build and run, and uh, it's built, so let's run see the application working. Come on, time is precious. And here you have Jack Johnson's tracks. So uh, I'd like to point out a few things. I have just a few minutes. Uh, one is this. Uh, in the pod file, all I said is, I want AF networking. I can do more uh, and be specific. So I want this version of AF networking. So 2.1.0 or 2.0.3. So this is going to go. And of course, uh, I should not forget to run again pod install. And this is going to go and pull 2.0.3. Uh, it's funny that I talked about uh, AFNet, uh, sorry, CocoaPods, without even showing the website recently redesigned. Congrats for that. We're with a very, very nice uh, search. So let's let's pretend we do not know about uh, AF networking, and I'm going to search that, and it already filtered a lot of. Uh, possible matches. Uh, I'd like to show this. So here, if you roll over onto this, I guess, document icon, you can go and cut and paste. Uh, Why well, I can tie? Oh, probably if you just click, it should paste exactly. And uh, uh, I'd like to show you this operator, which says at least 2.1.0. Um, and also, each library has associated a documentation, so which opens the cocodocs.org, uh, which is a companion website. And here, uh, very nicely formatted, you have the documentation of all the versions of a specific library. Uh, finally, I'd like to show you uh, a recently added command. So let's say you are on uh, cocopods.org and uh, you do not uh, know what's around, uh, what's new, and stuff like that. Or you stumble upon a very nice library, but you do not want to uh, create a toy project, import the library, and then type a few lines of code to have a demo of, of uh, what the library does. Well, this command command is pretty cool, and it's called pod try. And for the Cocoa Pods that I've set up an example, and and a map kit is one. This goes and pulls not only the Cocoa Pod of any map kit, but also a running example for this library. So you see. I didn't click and do anything. I have an Xcode project ready to be run with the NA map kit uh, library. It's 20 minutes, so I guess it's time to move on to Orca's part. Awesome. Uh, great.
Let me get started then. Do I need to... Am I now the head guy? Uh, Should I unshare? No, I don't need to. <laughs> Maybe Ray changes who's the screen. So, what's the question order? Oh, uh, do I need to? Oh, I was going to wonder if uh, I've got a keynote thing that I can play. Oh, Show off some okay. of stuff. All right, yeah, if you want to share the keynote over on the side, you'll see a screen share button. Uh, click sure. the screen share button. And make sure you choose desktop. Don't choose an individual window. All right, that should be set. Is that working? Uh, I still see you. Oh, uh, no, technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> um... Let's see what's going on. Okay. Oh, well, if not, I can just take some questions and answer them instead then. So I can pick up some of these questions that we have here along the side, um, and I can take some from you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll just dive into the questions now. So thanks, everybody, for asking questions. You're doing a good job uploading the most popular ones and so on. Um, so we'll go with the first question here, and uh, please forgive me if I mispronounce anybody's name because I'm terrible at that. Yeah, good luck with this one. <laughs> Uh, but this guy, uh, Gregor Zajak, uh, he wants to know, is there any tool or catalog that allows browsing for libraries supporting CocoaPods? So let's say I'm interested in a gallery or a scroll menu, and I want to query for available libraries. Um, so right now that's actually dealt with pretty well by a third party, which is um, the custom Coco controls. Uh, we have all the metadata available in CocoaPods, like giving out screenshot URLs and telling you, you know, who, who the Twitter handle is associated with these libraries. But right now, uh, we've been concentrating on like a text-based interface, like you saw in the search. Um, and I think at some point we will be moving to be able to show you like more of a browse between different um, between different sections of of the actual CocoaPods library. What I'd really like to see is something a bit similar to a uh, Ruby framework uh, website called uh, Ruby Toolbox, which is like a curated list of like all the best of certain types. And I think that would probably be the best way to actually, um, you know, see the, all of the different types of scroll menus and see all of the different types of uh, image galleries. And then you can just do pop try really quickly from those. Cool. So to clarify, the website, the third-party website you're talking about right now, is that CocoControls.com? Yeah, that's CocoControls.com. Okay. They, uh, they do a really good browse experience, and they also have screenshots, and they have a one-liner to install a CocoPod. I think okay. they're doing quite well. Cool. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from David Oakham, and he says, uh, what can you tell us about setting up a private CocoPods for instance, if you want to have a framework that's within used within your own organization, but used the same way that any other CocoaPod setup, you know, not necessarily open to the public, in other words. Yeah, this is um this is something that we've been focusing a lot in our documentation. So private pods are supported just as well as any normal pods. Um, just in fact, this is quite relevant because right now Facebook came out and said, you know, with their new app, Facebook Paper, they had so many libraries that they couldn't even actually keep it all in Xcode, and it, Xcode would just take minutes to load up. Um, people have also, it, in contrast to this, been actually posting articles um, that we've been collating on our guides um, about how you can... Um, and how you can do large projects with multiple apps that are all sharing multiple code bases. It works a lot like how our main specs, our pod specs repo works, wherein you go up there and um, you can create your own repo, you give it a URL, and you say, this is where, uh, this is where all my private pod specs are going to be held. Then you add that to your project. Um, honestly, the easiest way to find out about all this information is on our guides page, um, which is guides.cocopods.org. 
and there's one that's just there that says private pods, and they'll tell you everything that you need to know, and probably a bit more too. It's really okay. easy. Great. Yeah, I just browsed to that website. It's really easy to find. It's in like the middle column there, and um, yeah. when we post this on our website, we'll put a direct link to that. Um, Perfect. Yeah, because, I mean, loads of people use this now. We use them all as developers. It's a really core aspect of the tool. Um, all right, so the next question, it's also from David Oakham. Uh, and sure. the question is, um, so, you know, one of the advantages of CocoaPods is it helps you keep a library you're using up to date. So his question is, what kind of notifications will you get when a pod is updated? For instance, say you're using AF Networking 2.1, and sometime after you start your project, 2.1.1 becomes available. How will you know that a new library is available and that you can upgrade? And what's that sort of process like? Can I, can I take this? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I assume that if you're using a third-party library, at least you're going to star or watch that on GitHub. But a few months ago, PodLife, which is an iOS application, was released. And it's great. So it allows you to monitor, uh, you know, star libraries, uh, the libraries that are, you are using. It shows a stream of the most, uh, most, uh, most recently updated libraries. And you can also, if you like, have push notifications. Um, so you're really up to date with all the new versions of the libraries that you're using. Yep. And we've been working on push notifications for Safari. Oh, so right. that you'll actually be able to see it um, on your Mac too. Hey Shashray, what was that URL again? The pod like life? Uh, it, there's an application, uh, iOS application, it's called Pod Life. Now I, okay. I don't have a URL right away, but you can search it in iTunes on the iTunes store. Uh, by the way, uh, I'd really like to uh, uh, try to extort at least one minute of, of the presentation that Orta did at the Mobile uh, Central Europe conference um, talking about who's behind CocoaPods. Uh, it's not just technology, it's not just, just servers and commands on a terminal. There's a lot of people behind CocoaPods. I mean, in terms of actual raw committers, we have somewhere like almost 2,000 people who have actually worked towards getting CocoaPods as it is to be a system. Um, and in terms of actual people who have helped build the tool, we're probably looking at about 150 like, people that have probably had to learn Ruby in order to work on this tool. It's been super interesting to watch and kind of help out everyone as they're trying to get started in this. It's a, for a lot of people, it's their first foray into a large open source project. Yeah, so that brings me into a question I actually wanted to ask for you, Orda. Um, what is your specific role in CocoaPods and sort of how did you get started in it and you know, how have you seen the project grow over time? So um, I started by contributing to the specs repo as someone who was just uh, going in every day and maintaining pull requests. So that was helping people understand how to uh, do what they want with CocoaPods and just doing that daily, daily for maybe a few months. Um, and then I took a break and I came back and someone else was doing it. Uh, but I was already in the chat room hanging out. So I started building something that's called CocoaDocs. Um, and Whilst building CocoaDocs, I started to feel a bit constrained by the design of CocoaPods, um, which eventually led to me deciding that I would be the design dictator of CocoaPods. And um, that is really how I ended up taking the project. Um, and so now, generally, I spend a lot of my time working on the documentation and the assets and the website. Whilst I don't specifically always end up doing the design for things, because I have a lot of good design friends um, who I think do an amazing design, much better than I can do it. Um, I end up just making small edits to things and moving things around and saying whether this makes sense for the branding of CocoaPods and actually trying to think of the project at a higher level than just a bunch of hackers trying to make something work. Um, I think it really kind of gives this nicer feel and makes it feel like 
a lot larger and mature project. Awesome. So this is just like a part-time thing you're doing to contribute back to the community then? Yeah, exactly. Uh, at this point, it's kind of self-perpetuating. Um, I don't know if I can leave at this point <laughs> because, you know, so many people are relying on sort of the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and at this point, to be honest, I, I kind of get paid to do what I'm doing. Um, my company, uh, Artsy, that I work for, they they provide hosting for Cocoa Docs. Um, whenever we get, like, swag, that's usually paid for by them as well. And they'll pay for my dev time, to, and they have expectations. I actually spend time working on Cocoa Pods. Um, it's really cool. So other than, your, uh, other than yourself, what are some of the other sort of lead developers involved in Cocoa Pods that we should know about? Sure. Um, so some of the highlights. Um, there's the guy everybody presumably knows, Mr. Eloy Duran. He's uh, the guy who started CocoaPods. Um, he's a very serious Ruby hacker. He now works on Ruby Motion, um, which you may have heard of as well. Um, there's Fabio Pelosin, uh, an Italian freelancer who pretty much does most of the work on uh, CocoaPods nowadays. Um, he's a really energetic and interesting guy, and I totally recommend everybody to follow him on Twitter. Um, we have Florian Hank, who's the guy who's built our search engine, which is a completely separate project um, that he just does for us. Um, he doesn't even actually write Objective-C codes, so he just spends all day writing a Ruby search engine for CocoaPods, but doesn't actually end up using the end result. Um, and then there's someone like Andy Myers, who's our designer. There's um, Swizzler, who's building a bunch of uh, push notifications. There's Kyle Fuller, who's doing some... Um, he just does everything that I ask him to do, like fixing up Cocoa Docs. Michelle Titolo does a lot of like community outreach over in San Francisco. Um, Marin Yusal, uh, you might know him from Kiwi or from Alcatraz. He also spends some time working on CocoaPods. We've got a lot of people that are just like sitting around chatting about how this tool can work. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's a big website for it all it's on cocoapods.org slash about. Um, check, check that. Great. I'll put a link to that in the, um, the, sh in the notes for this as well. Um, I want to go back to David Oaken's question because I think there was one part of it that wasn't answered. So, Shashare, you kind of mentioned about that app, Pod Life, that would give you push notifications when um, libraries updated. But say you, okay, say you know, okay, this library has been updated. What's the process then to then get that updated version inside your project? Oh, you simply open the pod file and uh, you update the version number and then you rerun a pod install. That's all. I guess it's going to take without a, with, uh, on a very slow connection, the whole process should take two minutes. Another alternative is to do pod update instead of pod install, which will use the same kind of uh, same, if you have quite a vague uh, settings for your numbers, then it will just try and find the latest highest version of what you accepted earlier. That's a pretty useful way of doing it, too. Okay. And to go in with that, is it better practice to put specific version number for your project for a library or to let pod update, you know, automatically update the version of the library for you? I tend to be specific, but that's probably a legacy of my uh, Ruby, of the Ruby developer inside me. Uh, Honestly, I don't know if it's common. Orta, have you any experience about that? I don't know. It depends if you're in control of the library. Because um, if you're in control, then you should just leave it vague. But if, you, right. uh, if you're relying on it heavily, I would always scope it maybe to a, like, the second point so that you know, you'll get patch releases, but you'll never get major features. Um, so you'll have to manually know that you're going to go and update the latest version. Uh, it depends, again, on your use case, and especially if you've got an app that you're not going to come back to for a while, and then suddenly you pod install and you've got a completely different set of libraries. Okay, great. Um, I think that takes care of that question. Uh, the next one is uh, from Lai Yanov, and he would like to know
exclude some dependencies from a release build using CocoaPods. Oh, yeah. Um, if you actually go look at the commits on CocoaPods uh, today, there is some things that Alloy has been working on um, related to this. I don't know how far along he is, but this is definitely, 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 definitely something that we want in. So, yeah, because I do it all the time. I've, I've pushed with, like, reveal in my uh, in my library in my app and luckily the app store have said no you don't want this in but <laughs> it's easy to make that mistake okay so if I understand right this is a feature in progress that should be out very soon uh, I can't promise very soon but I can <laughs> promise it will be out <laughs> okay all right uh, let's see here next question this is from Sergey Efimov. Uh, so he says, I understand everyone is hackers here, but is there any plans to have a nice little GUI for CocoaPods with libraries, browser searching, checking boxes to choose what to include, and so on? So there's like three major plugins at this point that do some of these things for Xcode. Um, and there's been some discussion about whether we could do a, a separate app that's not a plugin for Xcode that might work on it. But... Um, Really, we have to wait on a little bit more of our tech side before we can do that, because it's very difficult to kind of generate the metadata that you can put into your pod file out by, via a GUI, because you can do some very complex stuff. And you need to once you start making very, very big apps. And so eventually, but it's not on the to-do list anytime soon. So you, you did say there were three pl third-party plugins or something that people could use, though? Yeah. Um, if you load up Alcatraz, which is a plugin uh, package manager for Xcode, um, they are in there. Um, but otherwise, you could just do a search for Xcode CocoaPods plugin. Um, I know Delissa Mason, uh, Catarali, does one. Um, and she's actually in the CocoaPods dev team, so she gets to chat with us all the time about how it's going. Um, there's another one that's further along than hers um, that's doing a different kind of way of thinking of it. And there's some hack projects that I've done um, with Boris Bugler, which are kind of how I see, as from a design perspective, how um, CocoaPods could integrate with AppCode, app code, with Xcode. X app code, by the way, does integrate with CocoaPods pretty well. Okay, great. Um, okay, the next question here is, um, once you have CocoaPods installed, is it possible to back out individual pods from a workspace? So in other words, say you have AF networking and then you change your mind, you don't want it out. Is, this, is removing a CocoaPod a complex process? Not at all. You just remove it from that list and run pod install again, and it should just disappear. That's everything. Sweet. Okay, next question here uh, from Danya Telishkin. Uh, you've been talking a lot about pushing pod versions to a server a lot like Ruby Gems do. Do yeah. uh, you have any deadline or estimation when this might be available? I don't think we have a deadline, uh, but we, we, we genuinely have the entire support in the app right now. Um, so anybody that until our big specs repo issue had been using pod push, which is a tool that's built into CocoaPods to push them up in the same way Ruby Gems do, um, we've been making like a test, a test specs repo that is entirely uh, generated by um, by actually a central server that has authentication. So I couldn't go in there and edit AF networking um, if I'm logged in as myself. Uh, that's there. We just haven't made the, the, sort of the switch to turn it on for everybody yet. Um, but fortunately, I don't think we've ever tried to figure out when we could do that. Because there's a lot of uh, moving pieces that could break when we make that switch. OK. Great. But, um, yeah, that's great. No answer. No answer. It's open source. We do it when <laughs> we want. <laughs> All right. Our next question comes from. Uh, a tutorial team member who's actually here in this chat, I think. Uh, so do you want to go ahead and just ask it? 
Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering, if I write my own libraries, how do I actually get them into CocoaPods? It's uh, probably awesome. very simple, but I've never actually uh, looked up how to do it. So it would be nice to have uh, some like quick instructions on how to do this. Cool. Um, the way that I do it, because I make quite a lot of pods now, um, is we have a tool built into CocoaPods called uh, pod lib create, which will create a lot of the, the it will do a lot like bootstrap does for websites, but for your CocoaPod. Um, so it will give you things like a readme, a license, um, it'll set up all your folder structure in a way that makes it very easy to then just uh, create the, the pod spec and then send a pull request to uh, CocoaPod's specs repo. Um, again, we have a good guide on this. Um, but in general, it's a case of, do you want to just quickly test that both the tag has been set correctly on your repo, that the source files that you expect are included in your pod spec, which is a little Ruby file that kind of describes how to put everything together to turn it into a library. Um, and then you take that one single file that is like the, the CocoaPods ingredients file, and you submit that as part of a pull request to the CocoaPods spec repo. And that's how you get it on CocoaPods. And then from there, everything else is automated. CocoaDocs will go and generate your documentation, et cetera. OK. Because um, some people have submitted pod specs for libraries that I wrote, but they're not actually part of my library. So that's also possible, I suppose, that uh, yeah. it doesn't really matter where the pod spec comes from. To some extent, we, we, we have a forced rule um, that forces people to not be able to do that after the first version that they've put up. So let's say um, you have a really popular library, somebody goes and makes a pod spec for it, and we say that's version 0.01, which is like the unauthorized version. Um, but from that point on, they can't ever update that. So it relies on you as the um, as the maintainer of your own library to use git tags to say this version is official. Like this is my sort of supported 0.2 release, and then uh, and then a CocoaPod spec can be made about that version. Does that make sense? Yep. So what if I don't want one of my libraries to be available as a CocoaPod? Because people <laughs> have added pod specs to things that I wrote that don't really make sense. They're not really supposed to be reusable things. It doesn't yep. make sense for people to add them to their projects. So it's a bit silly to have it available as a as a, as code a library for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we still accept pull requests asking them to be taken off. Um, we try not to like allow people to have this kind of, we, we, we bring it up as a discussion, but there have been times where people have gone and taken off multiple libraries that they own because they didn't want to have support it at all um, coming in through CocoaPods. Uh, I don't really, you know, I find it acceptable. <laughs> I, I can't demand that no one, that people can't play with their own ball and have it in their own court. Um, so it's just a little bit naff for everyone that was relying on it, but so is life. We can't demand that someone support it. Because that's just not fair. So, so send a pull request, get it off. <laughs> so, so if I do remove a library and somebody has it in their pod file and they up to do pod update or whatever, it just yep. removes it from their yep. workspace. Okay. Yeah. So it will uh, it will be on the local computer until they try and update, and at that point it will go away, and we'll get the the hey, what happened to library X Y Z? Okay. It happens. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, the next question it looks like it was a uh, appointed question to me by uh, <laughs> podcaster Mick, and he wants to know, are there any plans to update this super out-of-date tutorial that's on raywendelick.com? What's going on? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, it, we do need to update that. It's 18 months old at this point, and actually somebody's working on that right now. Uh, Joshua Green, who's one of our new tutorial team members, is in the process of updating that. 
So it shouldn't be too much longer. Sorry, everybody, for uh, the delay. As you know, it's quite difficult to keep all of our tutorials up to date since we have so many now, but we we do what we can. So coming soon. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next one here. Okay, so why does CocoaPods make the use of a workspace uh, necessary? Is there a way out, or what if my project needs to override the Xcode project settings of a library? So in general, um, we don't want to touch your project as much as possible because we're not Apple, and Apple can make any changes they want that we can't be entirely sure about. Um, so we use workspaces to completely separate out as much CocoaPod stuff as possible. Um, the ability to override Xcode project settings of a library can usually be done by having a custom pod file that it's like exactly the same as uh, the one that they have, you know, on the specs repo up in the sky, um, but actually has custom settings at the at, your, at the bottom of it towards the end, and then referencing that. But generally, I mean, if you have to have custom settings in a library, it's very likely that so is everyone else, I guess. Um, and at that point, it should be sent to everyone. Can I ask a question which I think sort of is related to that? Um, I'm wondering about things like you pull in a bunch of pods and maybe they seem to work nicely, but they generate a lot of warnings. So, you know, are, are there ways to kind of modify the way the imported pods are being handled by Xcode without actually having to fork it and, uh, yeah. and ha you know, manage your own fork? Or is that, is that something that you need to sort of go in and do that way, or is there a way within the sort of CocoaPods um, pod file spec to do it? For warnings specifically, yes. Um, there is a way of turning off warnings on a specific pod, or mm -hmm. all warnings for every single pod. Um, it's called inhibit mm -hmm. pods warnings, I think. Um, That'd be you a good name for it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It seems very logical. Yeah. Um, there is a, a section on the guides, um, which uh, I updated this morning, that has mm -hmm. every single um, thing that you could ever add to your to your pod file. So you can go through there and look at all the specific keywords, and that includes things like that, um, as well as a few local surprises. I, I mean, I guess, well, I don't want to interrupt if there's more questions, but one thing I kind of wonder in general is how much can you do with the pod file just with declarative information versus needing to get into understanding, actually having interpreted Ruby in there? Because I think you hinted at that when you suggested that it was very complicated. Um, yeah. you, know, I, I, you know, like one thing I encounter is I often have a workspace where there will be an iOS app, which is the main build target, but then there will also be an OSX command line tool, which is another build target that creates a command line tool that's used in the build chain for the iOS app. And I start thinking about, like, well... I want this build, I want this, you know, pod to be part of the iOS target. I don't, I want the other pod to be part of the OSX target. Is that the kind of stuff that can be handled smoothly right now in a declarative way, or am I actually sort of scripting things with Ruby in order no, to manage? it can be done manage... declaratively. Yeah. Okay. You can, um, you can say, you know, this is an exclusive to this target, or sometimes what, uh, what you do is have, with, with, larger libraries is mm -hmm. you have subspecs. So like you would say this is like the shared code. I have networking for example that says um, mm -hmm. this is the shared code for everything. If you only want something like the image views uh, mm -hmm. specific like code, then you could just do AF networking slash image views. Um, mm -hmm. And so you could do like in one of mine, I have one that's just for iOS and one that's just for OS X. So you right. do AR analytics slash iOS and that just brings mm -hmm. all the iOS stuff in. Alien slash OSX, which bring in the, the, the separate subspecs. So it allows you to do fine control. That works with so, dependencies too. So it's not the case that CocoaPods is always putting all the pods into one static binary that needs to be a single platform. So you can have different targets with varying platforms in the workspace, and yeah. the pod file can understand that. Okay. that. Yeah, and that's the, that, those are the sort of reasons why we can't just say, here's a tool that does everything because uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing gets very complex very quickly. All right. Um, the next question, 
I'm not even going to try to pronounce this name. <laughs> but the question is, uh, and this is for, for Cheshire too, uh, what are some of your favorite CocoaPods libraries that you think anybody listening to this should know about and, and use, other than they have networking? Do you want to go for it? I'm, I'm going to go and check my pod file out. Wait, I'm going gotta, I'm gotta to unmute first. Uh, well, I tend to pr prefer um, small libraries. So, for example, uh, MB Progress Hood is one that I use pretty often. I used to use AF Networking, but now I run my own networking code. I tend to run my, my networking code. Um, the one by Mr. Orta Terox is pretty good. One uh, he did a sort of meta API library. So you can interface with different analytics services using calling. So you keep on calling the same methods, but say that you start with Google Analytics and then you want to switch a few months later, you simply keep on calling those methods, but you switch to a completely different. Uh, I don't want to mention Flurry because these days uh, applications are going to be rejected, but other analytics services. So that's that's a pretty great library if if you are into the analytics world. I've been doing so much auto layout lately that I've been really becoming obsessed with understanding what the, the best way libraries for using auto layout are. Um, and mine at the moment is something called FLK Auto Layout. It's made by uh, Florian Kugler. He's one of the Objective C to IO guys. And he was also the one who wrote like the definitive auto layout uh, article at Objective C to IO. I would definitely recommend. Um, and then on top of that, I built a library for making stacks, which is like all I ever do nowadays in my work code. It's just stacks on stacks on stacks. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's really it, yeah. Uh, my pod file is probably about 90, no, is it 90? I think it's about 60 pods that I use in, in one of mine. Uh, it gets, I'm huge on writing open source code. Um, oh, I'll give you one more. FX Blur View by... Um, Oh, right. Dick Lockwood. That's a really solid way of doing the kind of iOS 7 blurring at this real time. Um, I was very impressed by that. Cool. Thanks for the recommendations. Um, all right, we have a couple minutes left. Um, I do have another question, but I, um, it's not 100% necessary. I wanted to give everybody who's actually in this chat right now if they had a question that uh, hasn't been answered yet, now's your chance. I have a little question. Um, I guess this is really a question about the kind of prevailing norms that are developing. But I was wondering, like, how small is too small for a pod? I know that the uh, NPM community has a habit of producing, they have this great dependency management tool, NPM, and or Node, the Node community, rather, and they'll produce modules that are uh, quite small, like just a single function that does one thing. Yeah. Um, is that something that you see people doing that you think people should be doing with pods? Uh, I wonder if you had a thought on that. Yeah, well, definitely. Well, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Or... <laughs> um, we're seeing a lot of this now. There's been a lot of talk and a lot of good blog posts lately about sort of small cocoa pods. Um, someone just did NS audit dictionary recently. Uh, other people just do UI color from image. These are super simple categories. On on Apple classes that just do one thing very quickly. I always use one that's ISO date formatter. I just use the same one. It's only one one class. I think there's a lot of scope for that. Cesar? Yeah, yeah. My opinion is this the very uh, very in line with the Unix philosophy of doing this um, tools as small as possible like a date for matters, number for matters. I, I, I really, it's so easy to include a cocoa pod. So I, I prefer this number for matter and this, and a state for matter made by two totally different guys instead of a huge cocoa pod of formatting for formatting every mm -hmm. kind of of data. Format so that, Do you yeah. start? Do you start to run into namespace problems when you're pulling in, you know, 60 different pods, or do you find that people are good enough with namespacing discipline that that doesn't come up? So far, so good for me. Well, uh, I did say NS uh, audit set, an audit dictionary, right? Some people 
is that still new? Don't know that you should be like prefixing your categories or um, not using NS. We're already hitting some of the problems with uh, you know using two-letter uh, prefixes. Like, I'm not the only person using OR. There's other people using AR. So mm -hmm. use free characters, and we'll still hit that limit pretty soon. I don't really know if we'll ever get off free of that unless Apple fix it at, at language level. Okay, thanks. Uh, anybody else? We have time for one more question. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and ask the one I had then. Um, so oh. what are the best practices regarding to putting a project that uses CocoaPods in the source control in terms of, like, your git ignore file? Like, should you check in your pods or just, you know, not and check in your pod file instead? And any other things related to that? Susan? It's a contentious one. <laughs> right. Uh, you can do both. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, you can. You can put in. You, sh you should always have your pod file and your pod file dot lock. Whether you choose to put your pods folder or not depends entirely on the type of project that you want. If it's something you know, you're working full time on it and you'll just keep going, I would have put the pods in. That's not. I know Ally and Fabio would. <laughs> That's two versus uh, two versus one there. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, Shashray and Orta, thank you so much. This was really awesome. The demo and the slides were great, and the questions were awesome too. I really appreciated having somebody with the inside perspective here. That was great. And, um, for everybody who is watching, uh, thanks so much for watching. Uh, we have these things every month now, so you're welcome to attend anytime. And uh, we'll also be posting this video up on the site now do my best to put links to as many things as I can uh, in terms of what these guys are going to do so you can look them up later. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>